it, it grew into something that, that kind of, yeah, no, I, I, there was nowhere for me to go in the end and I nearly took my own life. Um, and, and the thoughts, you know, were around harming people, young people, vulnerable mm. people. Um, and obviously when you, when you have thoughts like that, the last thing you want to do is tell someone because mm. you feel really evil. And no, it's not your thoughts. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like it's your thoughts. Mm. But it's like, it's like there's kind of like another something else that's, that's at work in, in a sense. Mm. And you, you naturally, it's like, oh my, how can I ever tell anyone mm. what I'm going through? How can I tell anyone about these thoughts? Because it's just so, they're just so horrible. And the, that's how the person stays trapped. Mm. That's absolutely what it is. Yeah. And, and research tells us, especially with OCD and certain anxieties, mm. that people keep this to themselves yeah. for so long. And they usually keep it to the point where there's, there's nowhere to go and, and they get into mm. a desperate state like I did. Back then, when I was young, um, I had to find ways to make myself feel better in my head. Uh, am I a bad person for having these thoughts? Am I going to kill somebody? Am I going to strangle someone? Um, you know, in my teenage years, it got to the point where I purchased a pair of handcuffs just to mm. keep in my pocket. That was my compulsion because I felt if I ever had an urge to kill someone or strangle someone, some, like a disabled person or somebody vulnerable, the worst kind of murderer that, I, mm. that could be, I'd just go into my pocket to feel my handcuffs and think, I can put my handcuffs on and then I won't strangle that person. Oh, wow. uh, but it went as far as, you know, I was even considering getting my arms amputated. I, I looked it Seriously? up. How, how do you do it so I wouldn't have to, I wouldn't hurt anyone? Um, that must have been, I, I, can, I think the word that's come into my mind is anguish. It was, it was, it was, a, you know, I came from a very loving family. Yeah. Um, and one would, you know, I was, I was fortunate that I came from a big family and a loving family. But uh, yeah, it, it was, it's, it was mental torture. Well, it started in secondary school. Mm -hmm. There was girls in the older year and they were... It wasn't physical bullying, it was... like... whispering and looking and... Mm. and that made me very anxious and... Was that the first time you'd experienced anything like that? So before that, everything was okay? Yeah, the first year of the secondary school, I was fine. Yeah. I was quite happy and I used to like doing drama and mm -hmm. I used to volunteer to read out to the class. And okay. But then, yeah, there was these girls, these group of girls. So that made me anxious because I was just worried about them all the time and I didn't want to be near them because I felt panicky and and I couldn't tell my friends because I was mm. embarrassed so and I didn't I didn't eat because I was scared well I didn't want to go to school I, I found it very hard mm -hmm. and concentrating on my work as well there was also um, girls in the same year as me as well mm -hmm. and I wasn't in the same classes as my friends so it was even more hard and mm. people always used to ask me why am I so quiet and once... Did that make you feel worse? Yeah it did and mm -hmm. a teacher asked me in front of the whole class if I had a tongue and oh. I, was, I was really okay. horrible, I, yeah. I always remember that so stuff like that mm -hmm. as well and it made things worse for me. It kind of happened around about the time I actually left Wigan. Uh, I just mentioned we got promoted to the Premier League and mm -hmm. we had a bit of a, a falling out over contracts and stuff. They wanted me to stay, I wasn't happy with the contract and I ended up leaving and, and moving to Norwich which was in the league, the league below the Championship and straight away I knew I'd made the wrong decision. And mm -hmm. being in Norwich, just signed, I very quickly became homesick and stuff. And I've always been kind of an emotional person, even as a child I was always led by my emotions and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I knew I'd, I'd made this decision, I didn't feel it was right. And I was alone and I was very frustrated that I'd made this wrong decision. And you know, that kind of very quickly escalated in, into something a bit more deeper and stuff. At that early point, it, I knew this something wasn't right because I'd go home and I was literally kind of like, I'd, I'd, I'd cry to myself because obviously um, I felt like I was letting everybody down. You know, I think I said before about my background and my, my grandparents who'd worked so hard coming from the environment they'd come from, you know, working so hard to get to this country in the first place. 
I felt like I had such an opportunity to impress everybody, not just my grandparents, but mm -hmm. the rest of my family, my sisters and brothers, and I wanted to provide for them. So they weren't actually putting pressure on you, it was you yeah. putting pressure on yourself? It was all pressure from myself. And yeah. Looking back now, it was all pressure from myself. I think lots of, there have been lots of incidents, you know, where people have been depressed and they could turn to drugs or alcohol or even gambling. You know, there's been lots mm -hmm. of instances where people have done that. Uh, I actually didn't do any of them. I actually used to, I used to go shopping a lot. Okay. You know, after training, because shop, shopping is very therapeutic, it used to make you feel better. So I used to spend a hell of a lot of money shopping on... How much are we talking here? Each, each spending spree? Each spending spree. I'd spend hundreds of pounds a day just buying stuff that I actually need, clothes especially, yeah. cars that I didn't need, because it would make me feel better for that yeah. brief moment. Was it yeah. also to kind of maybe show people that I'm doing all right? Yeah. Obviously. You know, obviously my, my career wasn't doing as well as I want, but still if I, if I turned up in a brand new, a brand new car, you know, obviously on the surface I'm doing pretty well here. Yeah. Yeah. And it would make me feel good, yeah, for a day or two. But then I'd be, back to, I'd be back where I was when I went home and stuff. That's all. Towards the end, it got to a point where I was on the verge of suicide. And uh, it, it, it was, I was planning my own suicide and, you know, I was, I was desperate to, to find somewhere else. You know what I mean? I didn't want to be around and stuff. I do, I do remember the day because, I, like I said, I planned my suicide. I used to daydream about it a lot. You know, I used to daydream about, you know, I'd be better off not here. But the day when it kind of like, there was an event over a weekend where things really escalated between my ex-partner and we mm -hmm. had a huge argument and stuff. And I think it was the morning, it was actually the, the, the death of Gary Speed that morning where he took his own life and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that morning... Was that shocking for you? Yeah, that was shocking and something clicked and I actually reached out for the first time properly. I rang my dad and he came round and he, he had to check me into hospital and stuff. And I was the last of uh, eight children, Irish Catholic family. I was the mm. uh, seventh boy and one girl, and I was the youngest. Yeah. And my mum put all of my, all of her siblings in care at one time or another. But I was put out with the rubbish at two weeks old. My mum did have some sort of breakdown and she put me out with the bins and somebody yes. called social services and I was taken in and brought up by nuns and nurses till I was seven. Possibly yeah. I could have a knife so they, they, you know, you'd watch them drag other kids out that were weaker. So that they wouldn't try and stab them. That would, cause they, they, just, they were just like going for the easier prey. Shortly after that, the police knocked on my door, two police women, and I didn't answer the door for a while because I thought, oh, it's the police again, you know. Yeah. But then I realised normally when they used to come and get me, they used to surround my house with about 20 policemen and not two pretty police women knocking at the door. So <laughs> yeah. I thought, this can't be them coming to get me this time. So I opened the door and they said, uh, you know, are you Paul, Paul? We need to talk to you. We're involved in Operation Mapperton, which is a, a 30 years uh, an investigation over 30 years of child abuse in your children's home. Can you can you can we come in and talk to you? And then they proceeded to tell me that everyone I'd grown up with, almost every out of a dormitory of eight boys, six of my friends had all committed suicide, okay. and my best friend had jumped on a railway, had jumped in front of a train at Mile End Station, and obviously it was quite devastating for me. Was that Liam, the one that used Liam to go to Carroll, the, the boxing yeah. Yeah. club with? The guy used to come to boxing with me, yeah. yeah. And he was, you know, he was one of the strongest, toughest kids I knew. And for him to do that, and then I realised, obviously, later on, that these kids were buggered from a very young age, from younger than me. And they, mm. were, they were abused from toddlers as young as two and three years old. So they didn't have any hope, really. And they had no education. And obviously, <clears throat> you know, I like to put labels on it. They said Liam was schizophrenic when he jumped in front of a train and all of this nonsense. But he just didn't have, he didn't have a future and he knew he didn't have a future. He felt he didn't have a future. Mm -hmm. He did have a future, but he felt he didn't. And then I went home and I was devastated. And uh, then I felt like I'd let everyone down. So I shoved a gun in my own mouth, knocked my own teeth out, took the safety off, went to pull the trigger and I had this cat called Sausage. His cats jumped on the settee and started purring around me and dribbling in my ear and I, oh, while I was oh. crying and shaking and spitting teeth out and I was, uh, I don't know what happened, I think the cat just was just purring and dribbling in my ear and for some reason I just, I just uncocked the gun. 
well, there's a special needs school near where I live and they asked me to come in to talk to the boys. It's all boys. And mm. the, the head teacher read my book and they read it in their curriculum. They're reading the book as part of their, their curriculum. Really? And it's turning the children's behaviour around. Wow. And they said, will you come in and, and you know, do Q&As and, and give the speech to the boys in the assembly? I was more nervous giving a speech in that, boy, in that special needs school than I was in the House really? of Lords. Really? Because they're wow. more important. Yeah. 